You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. 2021 is widely seen to be the make or break year for climate action. The countdown is starting for the United Nations COP26 conference in November in Glasgow, and expectations are high. In July, we at the ECB revealed an ambitious roadmap for taking climate change into account in our work following our strategy review. And today, we've reached one of the key milestones on that roadmap, the results of our first economy-wide climate stress test. I'm speaking to our Vice President, Luis de Guindos, about the results of the stress test and what they mean for people, companies and banks. Hello, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, it's probably worth briefly explaining. Stress testing is a tool that we typically use in our role as banking supervisors to gauge how strong banks are in the face of shock. Now, the principle for this latest stress test is essentially the same. We're assessing their resilience. But here we're looking specifically at risks caused by climate change. And this time around, we've also included companies in our analysis so that we can assess the economy as a whole. Mr. Higgins, what can you tell us about the findings from this particular test? Well, first of all, you are totally right. That's uh, you know the main the main goal of our uh, climate stress test. And if I have to summarize, uh, you know, the main conclusion and to put it in a sort of a nutshell, I could say that uh, we need to act today because the costs will only increase tomorrow. That's the main conclusion. That's the main point that we are making. We have to act now, and our stress test uh, findings support this even more. Concrete findings that I think that we should go to very concrete uh, and specific uh, points. Climate impacts are concentrated in some geographical areas and sectors. For instance, we have the, you know, the example of this summer. Countries in, in, in the south of Europe are particularly exposed to heat waves and wildfire risk, while North European countries are much, much more prone to flood risk. When talking about physical risk, sectoral differences matter less than geographical location. For transition risk uh, sectors uh, play a much bigger role, though. We found that, that mining, agriculture, and electricity companies could be the most impacted. Stress tests really are the, a key tool for us central bankers. One of the big challenges with uh, climate change is that while we do know that it affects the financial sector, the concrete risks are currently not understood well enough. The climate shock differs a lot from previously financial crises and can mater- materialize over longer time horizons, so very far in the future, between 30 and 50 years. As the stress tests help us better understand what climate change can mean for people, companies and banks, the economy, as you have said, as a whole. Very interesting and above all clear results indeed. Now we've talked a little bit about the what, um, let's talk about the how. Now what can you tell us about the setup of this stress test is new and quite different from past exercises conducted by other central banks. Can you explain a little bit about how it was conducted? Well, I think that this is a quite that unique uh, stress test, and as you have uh, said before, you know, it's, uh, it's different from, uh, you know, let's say, financial uh, consideration stress tests. Huh? Uh, this this one is much more you know tailor made in order to try to pick up you know the costs of climate ch- of climate change, and the uh, uh, and it's quite unique in scope and methodology. Uh, starting on the scope, it was uh, an economic wide stress test. This means that uh, we we don't look only at banks; we also include companies. In fact, it was the largest of its kind, looking at four million companies worldwide, and more of 1,600 banks in the Euro area. So, uh, you know, the level of richness of the database is, is huge. Uh, and we looked at the time horizon of 30 years into the future. This is uh, the most uh, comprehensive collection of climate and financial data in a central bank. On the approach, this is different to other exercises. We performed a centralized stress test 
This means that we didn't ask banks hmm, to self-assess the potential impact of climate change on the balance sheet, but we performed this calculation ourselves for all banks and companies in our samples. This way, uh, we were sure of the consistency in the approach. It also allowed us to look at such l a large number of companies and banks. And finally, on the methodology, for these 30 years, we looked at three scenarios and what they could mean uh, in terms of the impact on banks and companies. The first is the, fir the best case, what we call the best case scenario. Climate policies are put in place in this uh, scenario in a timely and effective manner. The second one is what we call a disorderly transition scenario. Measures are put in place, but late. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, you know, the worst case. That is what we call the hot house goal scenario. No policies are implemented, no action is taken. So just to go back, you mentioned that this is a centralized stress test. And our experts often call it uh, a top-down stress test as opposed to bottom-up. And that's this idea that the data is collected centrally by us, um, rather than it being provided by the banks and companies themselves, uh, as we traditionally do with the, the supervisory stress test. Is that right? You are totally right. You know, the top down is that uh, you know we we have our information, uh, and uh, you know we make uh, a sort of uh, you know uh, comprehensive assessment for the whole sector. But uh, you know we don't we don't receive uh, uh, the data from the banks or the companies, so uh, I would say that uh, perhaps you know this top down or centralized exercise is much more let's say uh, neutral than the bottom up. The bottom up is when we ask to the companies or we ask to the banks. So in that respect, uh, the outcome uh, we can say that is not affected but by any sort of bias. Huh? in terms of the answers of uh, and the responses of the banks. Understood. Now, you've also mentioned the three different scenarios that we, that we looked at and the effects of them. And, well, in fact, we've already seen over the past months that climate change can indeed have tangible and dramatic consequences. But it does seem that we, as a society, are lagging behind on taking action. Why is it so difficult to set the green transition in motion? Obviously, the bulk of the responsibility lies with governments, but what exactly can companies and banks actually do to, to get this going? Well, I think that this is a very important issue, uh, the one that you have mentioned. Uh, what are the costs of uh, investing in doing things differently today? And uh, how do they compare, for instance, to the long-term costs that will arise from climate change? This is the main, these are the two main questions that we have to ask uh, ourselves. We urgently need uh, to transition to a greener economy, and there are different ways of financing this. We have taxes, we have incentives, uh, even we can put a price on carbon emissions. Well, there are different ways. But uh, we shouldn't forget that the transition al also comes with a lot of benefits. First, technological developments can bring energy efficiency and revenue gains for companies and banks. And second, acting now helps uh, us avoid future costs due to the increased physical risk. As for example, you, 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 you know what uh, you know the floods uh, and uh, you know the wildfires that uh, you know, I mentioned before. Examples of what banks and companies can do, they can invest uh, in grid uh, technologies, for instance, make their production chains and processes much more sustainable over time, shift their portfolio investments towards green counterparts. Our climate uh, stress test captures all these aspects in the modeling framework. If, if policies to transition towards a greener economy are not introduced, physical risks become increasingly higher over time. They will increase exponentially, and due to the irreversible nature of climate change, such an increase will continue over time. We really need to start this transition now to mitigate the costs of both the green transition and the future impact of natural disasters. That's, you know, perhaps you know the main message that we can we can send. The stress test focused particularly on banks, and what risks do they face in particular? Well, we found that uh, climate change is a major source of systemic risk, particularly for banks with investments uh, concentrated in sectors and regions highly, highly exposed uh, 
to climate risks. For example, imagine an area with a lot of industry that is located near a coast or a river. We have so many of them here in Europe, think in the Netherlands, for example, the north of Germany, or even Italy. With climate change, extreme weather events are becoming more frequent. We have seen terrible floods in Central Europe this summer, which caused a lot of damage to people, companies, to the whole infrastructure. The same goes for the wildfires in Greece and other southern countries. For instance, I come from Spain, and uh, you know we have had quite a few of them. What does this mean for banks? Banks give out and grant loans to people and companies living in these affected areas. The effects of floods and wildfires can lead to people not being able to pay back these loans, which in turn means losses for the banks. The impact on banks' expected losses is mostly driven by physical risk, and it is expected to become more severe over the next 30 years. This is why an orderly transition to a greener economy is so important and so beneficial for companies and for banks at the end. Well, the results certainly underline just how close to home the risks are and how important it is that we act now, as you've said. Let's zoom out for a second to look at the wider picture and specifically our role as a central bank. Now, I mentioned earlier in the introduction that this stress test is a key milestone in our climate action roadmap. What else does it entail and how exactly does the stress test fit into that? Well, this stress test is a very relevant part of uh, the ECB's action plans plan to consider climate change in our work as a central bank. Climate change uh, can affect financial stability, as our stress test shows, but also price stability, which is, as you know, our primary mandate for here at the ECB. Therefore, we are committed to do our part within our mandate to tackle it. This action plan is one of the outcomes of our big strategy review, and was announced uh, earlier this summer in, in, in July. We put a lot of attention, a lot of emphasis on climate change in our strategy review. The action plan looks at all the different aspects of our work. It covers how to consider climate change in our monetary policy operations, how to better understand climate risk in our microeconomic models, how to check banks and companies' exposure to climate risks, as well as our own exposure. For example, the climate stress test methodology that we have we have used and, and the results that we have obtained will fit into two other important ECB stress test initiatives. The first one will be you know, the supervisory climate stress test. That it will be, you know, using our terminology a bottom up. We will ask the banks and afterwards uh, you know we will compile we will we will, we will aggregate uh, you know the, the the responses of the banks mm -hmm. and finally we, we are going to also to stress test our own balance sheet before we wrap up mr Higginbos, we always ask our guests for a hot tip linked to the topic we're discussing today what tip would you like to share with our listeners on the topic of climate well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to give a tip, no? But in my case, well, I have two granddaughters, five and two years old. And uh, uh, perhaps, you know, when, whenever you know, I deal with this kind of things, I try to look for, let's say, a human aspect, eh? a human consideration. And I think that sometimes, you know, uh, I, I, I think that perhaps the best legacy that uh, I can give to my granddaughters is, uh, you know, a clean planet, a planet that uh, is dealing with uh, the problem of climate change. And I think that, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, solidarity with future generations is perhaps, you know, one of the main aspects that I would like to, 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 to recall and to bring to the fore. Because I think that uh, sometimes uh, we do not consider that our actions are taking, are going to produce uh, consequences in the future. So everything that we do t in order to, to, to fight climate change is paving the way for uh, you know a better world for the future generations. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Let's now look more generally at our commitment here at the ECB in the fight against climate change and the next steps on the action plan that we've already touched upon. I'm joined now by the head of the Climate Change Centre here at the ECB, Irina Hemskerk, who joined in June when the centre was set up. Irina, welcome to the ECB podcast. Nice to see you joining virtually from Amsterdam. 
Thank you so much, Katie. A pleasure to be here today with you. Now, Irina, you've been setting up the Climate Change Center since uh, it was established and you were appointed as its head in June. Now, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the center's purpose. What What's the idea behind it? Yeah, so how I see the purpose of the Climate Change Center, it's really to shape and steer the ECB's climate agenda as we start to tackle the issue with more and more urgency and determination. And to able to realize this, the Climate Change Center, we will focus on three things. First is coordination. We bring together the work that is being done on climate issues in different teams across the ECB, from statistics, monetary policy, economics, financial stability, and so on and so on. So like really connecting the people and the content. Our second, second focus is strategy. So we are creating an overview of all the climate-related activities inside the ECB. And we're also monitoring the developments that are happening outside in the markets and at the political level. On this basis, we identify priorities to enhance the ECB strategy to address climate change. Thirdly, and lastly, we have a central role in steering the work across the ECB in order to implement the strategy and reach the climate, uh, climate priorities that we've agreed on. So it's kind of like bringing it all together and driving it forward at the same time. It sounds like you're going to be really, really busy over the next few months as, as work really starts to get going. Um, how's it going so far? I mean, to what extent is, is the centre already up and running? Yeah, so I joined in June. So indeed, uh, still pretty fresh on the job. And most team members just joined last month. This, of course, means that we're, we are still a bit in the startup phase of our work as we can build upon, uh, but yet as we can build upon the climate work already done, I do expect we can be quickly up to speed. Okay, Irena, I'm curious to know what kind of people you're actually working with in, in the Climate Change Centre and what kind of profiles you're looking at. Maybe you can take us a little bit behind the scenes because I, well, I've got to be honest, I have this kind of idea of a, a central banking expert that's also a climate scientist and knows everything about the environment as well at the same time, but that's probably um, quite unrealistic. So maybe you can just give us a bit of an insight into what kind of people you've got in the team there. Yeah, happy to do so. And to say, to start off with, in total, we will be a team of 11 people and we'll mm -hmm. be a very diverse group as typical for the ECB. My colleagues are from different countries across Europe, and we all bring in different perspectives with various backgrounds. Five experts in the team are seconded to the Climate Change Center from this different areas within the ECB. They are really their liaison between the technical work that is happening in the different business areas and the Climate Change Center. They are key for the coordination. And then we have three team members focusing on horizontal topics. So one is communication, the other one data and what you mentioned also climate science. We are still in the process of hiring a climate scientist, but I believe it will be quite unique and yet also very much needed to have someone in the team that can help us better understand how climate, how the climate is changing and the effects it will, the, and the effects it will have on the economy as well on the financial sector. The other three team members are the deputy head, the assistant and myself. We are there to ensure everything is managed smoothly and we can deliver on the expectations. And I'm, I'm just really pleased that the team is almost complete and the colleagues are just a pleasure to work with. They're all very highly motivated and great experts in their field. But next to the great people I work with, what I also really like about my job is that the work of the ECB has moved beyond acknowledging the importance of addressing climate change. So the work now is more in a stage of focusing on implementation and action. And I'm just very much motivated to contribute to that. Let's focus on what you've just mentioned, Irena, the work itself. And Vice President de Guindos mentioned earlier in this episode that the stress test, the results of which came out today, was just one part of our climate action plan. Another are the stress tests that we'll be conducting next year, on climate risks for banks, so on the supervisory side of things, and also for our own balance sheet. What are the next steps on these two tests? Yes, indeed. Uh, two other stress tests are planned for next year. 
and it will be based on the methodology and results developed for the economy-wide climate stress test that was published today and introduced by the vice president already. But firstly, our banking supervisors, they will be looking at how banks self-assess their own climate risk. So the idea is to test how prepared banks are to assess climate risk, but also to understand their potential vulnerabilities to climate risk. And the results of this stress test, this so-called bottom-up stress test exercise, they will also be used to inform their, our annual supervisory review process. Officially, we call it the supervisory review and evaluation process, or in short, SREP. And the preparatory work for these stresses has already started. Today's result of the economy-wide climate stress sets offer a useful basis for the different scenarios our supervisors will be testing the banks against. And now I could also say something about the other stress tests we're doing uh, on our own balance sheets. Uh, so we are currently collecting data and specifying the methodology for a climate stress test in 2022 of the Eurosystem balance sheets. This is the first time we'll assess our own risk exposure to climate change. And this stress test will also be based off on today's results. So in total, we will execute three different stress tests. The top-down economy-wide stress test that was published today and next year on supervisory site and also on the Eurosystem balance sheet. Let's talk a little bit about our core business now, monetary policy. In this area, we hear quite a few demands that we should be taking a bigger role in the fight against climate change. And that some of these are quite unrealistic, given that we're a central bank. In fact, executive board member Frank Elderson said on this podcast back in May, we are the policy taker here, not the policy maker. And governments are essentially the ones primarily responsible for fighting climate change. That being said, following our strategy review, we did pledge our commitment to include climate change considerations in our monetary policy framework. And one element that people look at quite closely there is our corporate bond purchases. Irina, what concrete steps are we taking here? Yeah, before diving into these uh, two concrete steps, uh, I think it's good to emphasize that at the ECB, we take climate change just very seriously. Governments do have a more powerful, do have more powerful tools at hand to combat climate change than we as central banks do. That's true. But we are convinced that the, every policy maker needs to contribute to tackling this global challenge with the tools it has at hand and the mandate it has been given. So our action plan on climate change and monetary policy very much reflects that. Concretely, the two actions I want to mention related to our corporate bond purchases. The first one, the first action is taking into account climate risk in our fin own financial risk assessment. We want to reduce the risk that we face as an asset holder to do that what we need to do to consider climate change as one risk aspect in our due diligence procedures for our corporate asset purchases. This we have already started to do. Secondly, we start to do more analysis if and how we could include climate-related eligibility criteria in our corporate asset purchases. So what does this mean? For example, we look at whether the issuers of corporate bonds that we hold or want to buy or are complying with the Paris Agreement or similar goals to reduce emissions. This is not something that we can implement overnight. We will first have to assess the possible effects for example, buying fewer or even no bonds at all from high emitting companies could help redirecting funds to low carbon activities. But it could also hinder transition away from carbon if it takes funding away from large polluters that have made firm and near term investment plans to reduce their carbon footprint. So here we think careful analysis is just very important. Well, that's quite interesting. It's, it's actually not as black and white as it might seem that you just stop buying bonds from these polluters because actually that might stop them from making the progress that we want them to make in the near term, right? Yes, indeed. Now, another aspect that we hear a lot about in discussions on this topic is transparency. And the vice president 
just mentioned that while we know for sure that climate change has an impact on the financial sector, the exact risks aren't necessarily that clear. That's right, Irena, no? Yes, exactly. And it's also important in the context of monetary policy. So this is the third aspect of the action plan I want to touch on. It relates to the much needed transparency in the field of climate change data. And we also want to practice what we preach. So in this regard, we have decided to start publishing climate-related information on our corporate asset purchases as of 2023, and as well as for our non-monetary policy portfolios. So these three actions I just mentioned, and also the stress tests, uh, the three stress tests, are part of a broader climate agenda of the ACB. And I can imagine that listeners might want to know more. So I would like to really like to refer you to the information on the website of the ECB. Absolutely. And we'll definitely link to that in the show notes as well. Well, it certainly sounds like you're going to be busy getting work underway. And before we wrap up and I let you get on with said work, um, we always ask our guests for a hot tip about today's topic of climate change and climate risk. I think for this one, I really would like to share the story behind the picture I have hanging behind me on the wall here in my home office. It is quite large and it shows the ocean and the horizon. And in the middle of the picture, in the middle of the ocean, there's one lonely mangrove tree with green leaves and its roots are standing out a bit above the water. This tree used to stand on the beach. The picture was taken on the other side of the world in Fiji, where the shorelines are already heavily eroded due to rising sea level. It was taken by Kadir van Lohausen. He's a great photographer who traveled to places around the globe to capture with his camera the impact that rising sea level is already having today. And the forecast, you know, it's not looking good. A report published by the World Bank last week concluded that climate change could force 260 million people to move within their countries by 2050. And hotspots of internal climate migration could emerge as early as 2030. So the reason I have put up this picture in my home office is to remind myself just every day that even though the wildfires that were raging over Europe last summer are extinguished, the flooded areas dried up, But we should not lose sight of the urgency to act now and prevent as much as possible that the impact of climate change is getting worse. This also brings me back to the topic of today, the results of the economy-wide stress test that were published. They show that climate change impacts us all, including the economy, be it companies or banks, and we have to act now. Well, Irina, I can see this picture. This is an audio-only podcast, but we're lucky that we can see each other as well. And it's a beautiful shot, but I would call it tragically beautiful. And um, sadly, it's all too easy to forget what's actually happening uh, as a result of climate change unless we have it in front of our eyes. So I think having a picture like that in front of you is 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 very useful. And Thank you so much for being on the podcast and giving us an insight into the work of the Climate Change Centre. And I look forward to speaking again when when the work is, is up and running. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be here. This brings us to the end of this episode. Check out the show notes for further reading on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you, so do share your feedback and ideas with us via social media. Until next time, thanks for listening.